Welcome to the Agile Wire, where professional scrum trainers Jeff Bubbles and Jeff Molesky discuss agile topics. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Bubbles and Jeff Molesky. And we are recording. All right, Mr. Bubbles, kick us off, man. All right. So this week on the podcast, uh, we got Fred Fowler. Uh, he's joining us from Bangkok. Uh, Fred, why don't you give our listeners a little bit of background about yourself? Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm I mean, where good. do you start, right? But yeah, like, well, I've had agile a, background. A quite interesting <laughs> and varied career. Uh, I'm, I'm very scrummy. I'm a scrummy kind of guy. I have a, a professional scrum master level three certification, which is I'm one of like a handful of people around the world who has that. Um, I've written books about uh, scrum. I uh, have a, a meetup group, which has got like 2,500 members. We meet every two weeks to talk about uh, Scrum case studies, uh, advanced Scrum case studies. And I've been teaching this stuff uh, for a long time. So uh, that's my kind of Scrum background. Now, my technical background, I wrote my first professional code in 1980. So I'm a kind of okay. an old guy. Uh, and uh, I, I started out as a computer operator way back then. I ended up as a CIO for a distribution company. And uh, then I, I left that to basically prefer, pursue, a, pursue, a, <laughs> pursue a career uh, all around Scrum and Agile because okay. uh, it just makes so much sense. And I'm very much of a – you could call me an evangelist. Uh, sometimes I annoy people by how much I say, this is such a good problem to apply the Scrum framework to. So so that's my, my professional career. So in your opinion, like, what is the thing that people get wrong the most about just Agile in general? Oh, wow. Well, <clears throat> you see, the, the most important thing people need to understand is that all of this, Scrum and Agile, all of it is about producing value. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is to create valuable software. Agile is about software and Scrum is about products in general. But the whole idea is to create valuable stuff. And the Scrum Guide says that the job of the product owner, which is one of the Scrum roles, is to maximize the value of the product. Now, maximizing something, you, in order to maximize something, you have to be able to measure it. So if you can't, if you don't measure value, there is no way to uh, optimize it. You, 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 you won't know what, whether you're doing something that will increase or decrease the value because you can't, you're not measuring it. And all throughout the industry, one of the biggest problems is that management, people, they measure effort. They measure how busy mm -hmm. people are and not the value of what they're producing. So uh, if, 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 if there's one thing that everybody gets wrong is that they're measuring the wrong thing. They're measuring whether people are working like eight, 10 hours a day, five, six days a week. Uh, they're measuring how busy people are. And you know so how, what? Do you, how, how would you go about doing that? Like, I, I could just imagine somebody like, okay, Fred, I get it. Value is what we care about, but that's really hard to measure. So what do, how do I do that? Well, it's hard to measure. It's not impossible to measure. Uh, but if you're not measuring value, then how do you know you're getting any? You see, it costs a lot of money to employ a team of people to create something. You know, a typical scrum team is like about 10 folks or less, but 10 Silicon Valley, uh, you know, coders, you know, the technical people, developers. That can be like $70,000, $80,000 for one two week sprint. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to pay people seventy dollars or $80,000, you're going to spend that while well, you better make sure you're getting at least seventy dollars or $80,000 worth of value out of that effort. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if you don't know, well, then how do you know whether you're creating anything at all? You know, there are lots and lots of horror stories. I've got to tell you one story. There's a guy named Roman Pilcher. Mm -hmm. uh, he was one of the yep. first Scrum product owners and um, a long time ago now. But he wrote a very important book called Agile Product Management with Scrum. 
And he talked about his experience uh, working for a medical services company, medical products company. And he headed up a project to completely redo their flagship software product. And it was a two-year project. It was very complicated. They did it using what's called the waterfall uh, framework. So analysis, analysis, analysis. And then somebody puts together a project plan with milestones and deadlines. And then you go through all that. And, uh, and he managed that project. And it was a very complicated project, a two-year project, millions of dollars in budget. There were nine different paths, which be, means nine different chains of activity with one critical path. And after two years, he brought the whole thing in on time and under budget. So it sounds like a success story. Well, the only problem was that they had built the perfect product for two years prior. And in the intervening two years, the market had moved on. And what they had produced was already obsolete before it was done. So they didn't measure the value of what they were producing because if they had, they would have seen that they were producing something that had no value. And they ended up, you know, throwing away millions of dollars and a couple centuries of man years producing something which they really should never have produced in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you, you say it's hard to measure value. Well, that's, that's true. You have to understand how value gets produced and how to measure it before you attempt to try to create something that's valuable. But if you don't, you run the risk of blowing lots and lots of money in time for, for no result. So yeah. do you have any like tips, strategies, tactics that you typically would employ to when, when, when you're going into an organization or you're working with a team, whatever that happens to be, and you see that common situation that you're talking about? Like, yeah. w- what is what is your next step? OK, well, first of all, <clears throat> there are four ways to increase value. Four different uh, possible ways to increase value. Uh, The most obvious one is increase revenue, you know, sell stuff. If you if you uh, have a team of people and they create uh, a new app called, you know, Goofy Golf or something like that. And you put it up on the the, the iTunes, you put it up on uh, Google Play Store and it gets downloaded a million times at $1.99 a piece then what's the value of that product? It's a million times. I'm not good at math, but I think it's like a few million dollars. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, a million times dollar ninety nine, one point nine nine million dollars. That's the value of it. Mm-hmm. And how do you measure it? Well, you sell it. <laughs> you see, see what people will buy. You know, that's the way you measure the value of something like that. Now, another way to increase value is to decrease cost. So if you make a million widgets per year and you make an effort to reduce the cost of each widget by 50 cents, then what's the value of that improvement? Well, it's a million times 50 cents. It's half a million dollars. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you can also uh, reduce risk. If you uh, if, if if you have a weakness in your system and every once maybe once a year something goes wrong, uh, well here's an example. When I was CIO of a company, uh, it was uh, in a town called Morgan Hill, California, which is about 30, 40 miles south of San Jose, California, where the big internet hub is. And we had our data center before I became CEO, they put the data center in the Morgan Hill office at the end of a long fiber optic cable to that internet hub. And uh, once a year, about some idiot with a backhoe would dig up the fiber and break it and pretty much cut us off from all 21 locations we had all around the country. And that pretty much put us out of business for a day 
And well, we were doing about a million a day in business. So, you know, that risk was costing us a million a year. So, well, would it make sense to spend some money to mitigate that risk? Well, for about $50,000, we moved the data center out of Morgan Hill and into a very secure location near Sacramento, which is kind of a big co-location place where Google and Facebook and all those folks have all of their servers. And it had double connection to the internet, one going east, one going west. It had redundant power. I mean, it was never going to go down. So for 50,000 bucks, we saved a million a year. Now, was that a good deal? I yeah, take it. it a good deal. <laughs> okay. So you can increase revenue. You can decrease cost. You can decrease risk. You can also increase opportunity. Now, let's say you make, you're in a bidding situation and maybe one time out of six you win the bid and get the business well if you can do something that makes it possible for you to win two times out of six well you can calculate how much money that's worth and you can then sure. stack that up against the cost of uh, 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 increasing that <clears throat> that possibility and, and figure out what the value is. So those are the four ways that value can increase, and it's pretty simple to measure them. Mm -hmm. And the most, most straightforward way to measure the value of any product is to sell it. Mm -hmm. you know? By the way, uh, in, in the world of lean, they talk about minimum viable products, which is kind of a small scale down version of some product that's supposed to be quick to develop. And the reason Lean focuses on that is so that you can give that to a client and get immediate feedback about whether it's valuable or not. You can even sell it. And that way you can get an idea of whether you're on the right track or the wrong track early on. Mm -hmm. So can I give you a little, so I'll give you a little pushback. So I love that we're not going to track activity anymore. I'm, I'm all, I'm all for that. Okay. Value is a lagging, but I would say value is a lagging indicator and a good friend of ours, uh, Pradeek Singh, he always says the, your only hope in product development is figure out how wrong you are as fast as you can. And so like hit the strategy there is like, you need to deliver very frequently to figure out how wrong you are. So you can start figuring out how to deliver the right thing. Absolutely. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Oh, well, that's absolutely true. The, the, you need to be uh, interacting with the with real paying clients soon and frequently. You don't want to wait two years the way Roman Pilcher did to find out that whoops, yep. you built the wrong stuff. So you need to be able to, uh, <clears throat> to to check and double check and recheck what the actual value is that's being produced. Now, uh, there is a, a, a problem, and that is you can't sell something that doesn't exist. You can't measure the value of People something. do do that, though. They sell well, paperwork. But. Yeah, paperwork right? <laughs> I don't know if it's ethical, but they do do it, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but anyway, you can't measure the value of something that doesn't exist. And so if you're going to make decisions about what's valuable, those are investment decisions. Yeah. <laughs> You have to say, I bet that this is going to be valuable. And so I'm yes. going to bet this 70000 bucks or whatever it is per sprint to create something. And then yep. afterwards, I can measure how valuable it is. See, I love that. So it's, it's this mindset shift, I think, that's out there in the world. So most of the world thinks of things as deterministic. Like I know as executive ABC that this will be valuable to my users. I'm willing to spend three years building it, and then I'm going to get all this value over the next decade. Well, that's all assumed value, right? And that's right. So, and they're making big bets with probably low probabilities of them happening. So why not make multiple bets, smaller bets? And even if they're low probability, some are going to hit, and then you're going to figure out what direction to go, right? So like... I think that's what it comes down to. So if I think of leading indicators that I would measure, so value is what I really ultimately want. That's my, you know, legging indicator. My leading indicator that I always go to when I'm working with different clients is we really want to measure frequency of delivery. And what's the leading indicator of that? It's 
it's really just aging of work. So I just don't want work to age. When we start something, I want to finish it. And when and we have two options. So if we if we can either not start something or we can finish it. That's the only way you let things not age. And so start with that, get to frequent delivery, then figure out how to pivot once you start, you know, validating inside of a marketplace. So I don't know. I think those things are all connected. What are your what are your thoughts on on those kind of metrics in that in that oh, connection? Absolutely. Uh, when you're saying aging, uh, you're basically saying you don't want a lot of work in progress because work in progress represents cost but unrealizable value. You can't sell something that isn't done. Right. That's one reason right. why it's kind of like front- Toyota it's kind of it's kind of like the Toyota way of thinking, right? Like Toyota did this right when they didn't have revenue and they couldn't compete with uh, big car companies. They just said we're going to do just in time, have just in time inventory, and they reduced their yeah. inventory costs so they could get stuff out the door faster. We're doing the same thing with knowledge work, is what we're trying to do, I think, in the agile community. That's Reduce right. your investment, reduces risk, and also accelerates your value delivery. That's right. That's one reason why the Scrum framework emphasizes that at the end of every sprint. Something has to be done and ready to give to a customer. So you don't accumulate a lot of half-done stuff that isn't really much good to anybody. Uh, the idea behind Scrum is that you there's a negotiation between the product owner and the developers. The product owner says, okay, this is what's b- desirable. Number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They're all desirable, and they're desirable in that order. And then in the sprint planning meeting, the developers look at that and say, well, okay, well, you know, in terms of what we have the ability to do, what our capacity is, we can do number one, two, three, and maybe number five. And then the product owner says, well, if you're not going to do four, then five kind of rides along four. So that's really, can you do six instead? And the developers say, well, yeah, we can. We can do number one, two, three, and six within our two-week sprint. And then the product owner and the developers then kind of shake hands and say, okay, that's the scope of this upcoming sprint. We're going to do number one, two, three, and six on our product backlog list. And then nobody held a gun to the developer's head. So they basically, of their own free will, said they were going to do that. So that means they kind of own that. And, and, and pretty much the product owner can hold them accountable and say, well, you said you were going to do this. Where is it? And, uh, and so uh, that way, <clears throat> pretty much every sprint, every couple of weeks, there's something tangible of value that gets produced. And it's up to the product owner to make sure that that value is there and is measurable, or at least can be measured pretty soon. So that then you can compare the value that's produced with the cost of the the team uh, and then come up with a statistic of return on investment made by the product owner. You can evaluate a product owner, somebody making decisions about what to be done based on the return of the investment on that on that effort. So So um, taking it. Go ahead. I was going to say taking a step back here and revisiting what we were talking about earlier. So. Fred, you had brought up, you know, me- me- measuring of value. So revenue, operations, expenditure, risk, opportunity, um, d- different lenses potentially to be taking a look at revenue. And then Jeff, you were bringing up more of a delivery side. So the number of deliveries that we're able to get out within a certain time frame, uh, work item age to make sure that work is getting done and not started all the time. So abstracting a little bit here, there's there's business metrics of the value that we are delivering to our customers, and there's operational metrics of how frequently we're, we're able to get releases out there. So two, two different lenses holistically that we should be taking a look at, how are we doing at delivering value to customer? How frequently is it getting out to them and how valuable is what we are getting out to them actually to our customers? <laughs> is there any, and I'm curious, because the, the revenue ones, Hopefully, make they make a lot of sense to me. I hope they make a lot of sense to everybody else. But for the the operational side of it, is there anything else that we would consider in addition to rate of delivery or and or work item age? Is there anything else that we would specifically maybe look for to say that we're we're delivering uh, in a healthy manner? Okay. Well, <clears throat> when you say operational, 
are you saying? I'm not sure, quite sure I understand what you mean by that operational distinction. Could you please amplify a little bit and then I'll be happy to answer. Yeah. So I, I'm thinking about when I think of business metrics, mm-hmm. I'm thinking dollars and cents. Like right. how do we know that we are delivering value to customers? When I'm thinking about operational metrics, I'm thinking about um, how well do we actually deliver stuff? Okay. Like, let's put value aside. Are we just good at getting shit out the door? Okay. Well, let me ask you something. If we're really, really, really good at getting stuff out the door and it's not valuable, then what good is that? So I also, I'll also push back is that you have the opportunity to learn it's not valuable and then pivot without spending a lot of money. So who knows what's right? Like, right? Like maybe, cause maybe you put stuff out the door and there's an 80% chance that it was going to be valuable, but you hit that 20%, you know, one out of five, dang it. We got that that wrong. And that's going to happen. But let's do that. If we have an environment where we're putting things out there and we're, and we're getting 80% odds every single time that it's going to be valuable. I think that's a pretty good investment right there in my money. I'll take that, that every single time. Mm-hmm. And so I want to be right more than I'm wrong. And the leading indicator is I've got multiple things out there to measure and then validate against into the marketplace. And so I think you have to know what is valuable and you have to be able to, to judge and have ways of measuring that value inside of a marketplace too. Like, yeah. I don't know, you know, it's, it's a number of transactions per day. It's a um, number of abandoning sharp shopping carts going down, you know, in an e-commerce site, it's whatever the metric is that you, that you're saying, like, we have a problem on our platform. It's this. Let's solve that part that should then lead to the revenue number because okay. there's some type of customer outcome, I think, that you're looking for. And okay. then you think that's well, going to lead me, to a company out in impact. Let, let me uh, respond to that and, and go back to um, one of the keys of the Scrum framework, which is the division of accountability and authority. In Scrum, there is a role called product owner, and that product owner has absolute authority to figure out what the team should build. In other words, the product owner can create a list of things to do. It's called a product backlog and can rank that in terms of, you know, what's most important to do now, what's less important. And nobody can uh, (coughs) contradict the product owner in those decisions. So the product owner is all about figuring out what would be valuable to do. And, 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 and you're kind of saying, well, wait a second, you know, the product owner isn't necessarily the CEO. What if the CEO tells the product owner, don't do that? Well, the thing is that that authority comes with it accountability. Since no one can tell the product owner what to put on that list, only the product owner can be held accountable for the success or failure of that list to develop value. And if somebody like a CEO tells the product owner, well, don't don't do this, do that, well, then guess what? The the product owner is off the hook. The product owner doesn't have to take responsibility because somebody else did, the CEO. The CEO actually became the product owner by doing that. Now, the product owner has that authority and that accountability because the product owner ought to have the capability of making those decisions well. The product owner ought to be a business person who is in touch with the client or in touch with the marketplace, understands it, knows what it wants, and can make decisions about what to create. And then basically be held accountable uh, based on the value that's created versus the cost of creating it. You know, one of the early Scrum projects I did uh, was back when I was the CIO of, of that the distribution company and my product owner was the COO, the number two guy in the whole company. And he was the best because first of all, he understood the business. Number two, he knew what he wanted. And number three, no one could contradict him. So that's the kind of person you need to be a product owner, somebody who can make decisions about what to invest in and have the capability to make them well, and finally to be accountable for those. Now, the other side mm-hmm. of, of that coin, the, the, the role of product owner is, is also married up with the role of developer. 
technician. Technicians have no business trying to figure out what's important to do. That's what the product owner is for. The developers have to figure out how to get it done, how to meet the needs that the product owner identifies. And the, the developers basically can figure out how to do it. No one can tell them how to do it. They need to be able to uh, decide for themselves how to do it. And again, the reason that they must be able to, to decide how to do it themselves is so they can be accountable for that. If okay, so tell me, tell me what you mean by accountable. That so let's just let's play out your scenario from before. So we're develop, okay. we're a team of developers. Right. We got one, two, three, six, right? That we pulled right. into the sprint. They get into the work and they say, you know what? Um, yep, these are valuable things. They're working on it, and they're like, oh, this touches this code. We should refactor it. Oh, this should touches this code over here. It's really messy and it's painful. We should refactor that. Get to the end of the sprint, and they don't have. They've got every all four items. You know, eighty percent of the way done. They have nothing, nothing to show for. No increment. Okay. Now you're the product owner. What does that mean to hold them accountable? Well, it basically means, well, what value did you create? You didn't create any value. Did a lot of of work. There's a lot of work in process, but nothing can be given to the customer. Mm-hmm. But basically, this sprint was nothing but cost. No value. And by the way, guys, if you continue to incur costs without producing any value, then why should I pay for you guys to do it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, most developers don't want to live in that world. They just want to say, oh, just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do my best. You know, tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, some product owners fall into that trap. They say, well, I want you to do this and do it this way and do it that way. I've seen product owners even put code samples in their uh, list of things to do. And the developers love that because, oh, you want me to do it this way? Fine, I'll do it. Oh, but you know what? It's too hard. Well, I can't do it. But that's not my fault. Mm -hmm. You told me to do it. And you told me to do something I couldn't do. So that's not my fault. That's your fault. You should have known better. Yeah, I, when I talk to teams about that, I think about it as like renting versus owning a home. So yeah. Like when you rent a home and you have a problem, what do you do? You call the landlord. So you call the product owner because oh, it's your problem. You gave me that code. You told me to go down this pattern, whatever yeah. it might be. Now I got a problem. You solve it for me or whatever yeah. it might be. Now, if you own it and you say, this is our solution, you got to figure out how to get through it, right? Like just like you own a home, like no one's going to do it for you. So you got to figure right. it out, you know? And that's why the two key points of the Scrum framework of bad developers are there. First of all, they have to be what's called self-managing. They have to make their own decisions so that there are no fingers that can point at anybody else. They make their decisions so they own them. The second thing is they have to be cross-functional, which means that they have to be able to create the product all by themselves. They, they can't say, oh, well, we did 80% of it, but that other 20%, that's somebody else's problem because, you know, we don't have the capability of doing that. No, the team mm-hmm. has to be capable of doing it all so that they can, number one, deliver value, and number two, they can be accountable for delivering the value they say they're going to deliver. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, there's a lot of accountability. Yeah, so... So, so, so here's what I was just going to say, like kind of going back to Jeff's point before, when you think about what other like execution things do you think about? So I always think about it as three main things that we really want as an organization. We want effectiveness. We wanted to get something that is going to provide value to a customer or a user, you know, when they want it. And then we want predictability. So that's that frequent delivery that we were talking about before. So we want predictability of when we're going to get something. We also want efficiency, but I think what we get confused about is we look at efficiency for the individual instead of inefficient efficiency for the team or for the product. Right. And so I, I what I would say is if I was that product owner in that case where you got, you know, 80, 90 percent of the work done, but you didn't get anything done and be like, OK, we want efficiency for me means I get something more frequently. And so how are we working? Like, I need you as a team to figure out how you can give me each item more frequently so like if you miss something cool it's one of the three items i'd rather have missed me one of the three items but i got three that are done in an increment that i can get value out the door in so you need to figure out how you can work that can deliver that way 
Okay. And so I don't, I don't care how you do it, but that's what I'm looking for. Like I want efficiency as a team to deliver things more frequently. Okay. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Well, let me just, just challenge you on something. You say everything's 80% sure. done. What does it mean for something to be 80% done? That exactly. That's what that's what they might say. Like right, eighty percent done. It's it's here. It's in a dev environment. It's not tested. We didn't do the automated testing. We haven't written unit tests yet. Well, whatever it might be, right? Like you, we hear this all the time when we're with different teams. Like yeah. people always, and that's the problem, right? With the definition of done, that's why we have it so that we can actually get the done because it's not eighty. It's you know, it's fifty because that t- last twenty takes another two weeks. You know, how how do you measure that it's eighty percent done? Exactly. You, that's but that's what they'll, you'll hear, right? When from people oh, yeah. when you're talking with a team, you'll hear that. Yeah. When I was CIO, you know, I had a bunch of people working to me, and I, somebody said, "Hey, it's ninety percent done. Great." Mm-hmm. Week later, it's ninety-two percent done. <laughs> Week later, it's ninety-three and a half percent done. You know, saying it's ninety percent done, there is no way to measure whether that is accurate or not. Saying it's 90% done, 80% done, whatever, is a guess. And you know what? There's no way to measure whether that guess is right or not. And most likely it's not. So that's why Scrum never bothers to measure, you know, percentage done, because there's no such way to, there's no way to measure that. Scrum is all about working with measurements, things that you can verify by putting them up against some kind of a yardstick. Mm-hmm. And what Scrum says is, well, you can't measure whether something is 80% done, but you can measure whether it is done. In other words, it meets the definition of done. Mm-hmm. So that's the only thing that's measurable. And so it doesn't make any sense to try to, to say, well, over 50%, so that means next week will be 60%. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. That's why it's up to this. What about – go Go ahead. Go ahead. I was, I was going to ask, you know, what about – so I, I sit on the product side of the house. And so, in, in fact, just having this conversation the other day with somebody is being able to project timeframes for a release. So mm-hmm. – You know, if we're producing an increment every two weeks and that increment contains five stories and there are 50 stories left on the the backlog that we're tracking down to our next release and Mm -hmm. we're, you know, we've got our deliverable metrics like we've been talking about like that. In your opinion, am I am I breaking rules there? Am I? No, No, you're not. I mean, you're basically saying the track record of this team is it does about five stories every two weeks. Mm-hmm. 50 stories, five stories every two weeks. Well, that's what, 20 weeks from now, right? If I did my math right. Okay. Something like that. We'll assume you did. Okay. But there's a big, big asterisk next to that. And the asterisk is provided everything stays pretty much the same as it is now. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. The right way to say it is based on what we have measured and based on what we expect to be working on, we can forecast that will be done in 20 weeks. Now, can stuff change in the meantime that would affect that? Absolutely. What could change? Well, let's say maybe your star JavaScript person on that team could get a job someplace else. Whoops, can't do five stories every two weeks anymore until we get a new JavaScript guy. What if you find out that what you thought you were going to be building turns out not to be what's needed and you have to change direction? Well, that can certainly affect whether you even want to build out that stuff uh, 20 weeks from now. The, 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 the only thing that is certain is something that has already happened. Anything that hasn't happened yet is uncertain. All you can do is make a guess as to what will happen. And, you know, that, that's one of the pernicious things about the waterfall uh, framework, you, 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 you do all this analysis and you build this carefully constructed plan with different 
paths and different milestones and stuff. And it's all a bunch of guesses. You have really no idea whether three months from now, that two week period you set aside for doing this thing is actually going to be relevant when you get there. And the worst thing about waterfall is that it gives you the illusion of certainty. And then people end up getting sanctioned for failing to make those guesses come true. Why didn't you meet the deadline? It's been in there for a long time. You didn't meet the deadline. What's the matter with you? Well, guess what? (laughs) That doesn't matter if you're building the wrong thing. You know, the whole idea of Scrum is to not make guesses and then force people to make those guesses come true because that. Yeah. So I think that, I think that's a a, uh, thing that we do with forecasting, right? We always used to do forecasting one time, very static in nature. It would be like, we're going to do this in the beginning of a phase. And we'd forecast one time. And then we would do it with what people said as a guess. I would ask Jeff. I would ask you. I'd ask other people on the team. How long is it going to take to do this, 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 this? And then I'd make some kind of forecast off of that. I think what's different in what we're saying in the Agile community is that we don't do this static. So we do it continuous. Like everything in Agile, we do it continuously. We do continuous planning. We do continuous forecasting. We do continuous delivery. So you're doing it all the time, and you're doing it with empirical data, data from the past that help us inform us of what's going to happen into the future. So as things change, we can say, well, this last sprint didn't go as well because we lost that JavaScript guy. Now we think it's going to be more like three stories you know, our PBI is every sprint. So now we're forecasting this and mm-hmm. unless we change something. And I think that's what's very different. It's kind of like, it's almost like a Google map, right? Like you run into construction. Now we have a, now we're going to have a 20 minute delay. You didn't have that when you started your trip, but you sure figured out that the construction was there or there was some kind of accident or whatever it might be that have been slowing mm-hmm. you down. And so we should just do that because the world is not deterministic. It's probabilistic. Like things happen and we need to be able to adjust. And that's what that's right. creating an environment for that, I think, is what we want to do as an agile as an agile organization or if you're trying to build that ability to respond to change. So when you're thinking about those efficiencies, that's what I would be looking for, Jeff. Like how do we respond to change and what what are some indicators of that inside of your organization? You know, like how fast can we pivot? How fast how do we adapt, you know, new constraints that come into our organization? And it's more about creating an environment where change is accepted instead of rejected, because that's yeah. going to make you more adaptable into the future. Thoughts? I don't know. I kind of went off well, on a little riff there. but Well, I, I, you're right. And that's really one of the key uh, insights in Agile, and that is that things change. And you have to recognize those changes and adapt And if you do, you can have great success. One of my favorite stories is about WebEx. Either of you know the story of WebEx? Mm Mm-mm. Nope. Okay. Well, WebEx, of course, is a Cisco product. And we all know it's this uh, online, you know, meeting thing. And, you know, basically it's one of the first ones. But it didn't start out as that. WebEx was created by Cisco as a way for their customer service representatives to log into customers' PCs to work on Cisco equipment. You know, Cisco yeah. stuff is very difficult to configure. You have to understand the Cisco configuration language. And so they developed WebEx to let their customer service people, in effect, take over a client's PC that was logged into the Cisco device and then manipulate all the switches and the the lines of stuff. That's what WebEx was developed for. And then somebody noticed, hey, well, you know what? Maybe we could do this other thing with it. So the whole focus of WebEx changed into what it is now because they adapted, they, they, they were able to forget what their original intention was and then recognize what their customers were telling them that there wasn't this other opportunity over here. They pivoted. And there are plenty of stories like that. I mean, there, there are lots mm-hmm. and lots of products that started off something completely different than what they are now. So um, you just, you know, Agile is all about making sure you understand what is actually going on. You need to examine through empirical methods 
what the world is telling you. And then you have to mm-hmm. listen and then you have to adjust so that you end up delivering what the world wants. Now, let me ask, let me ask you something. If a team is developing good value, in other words, if the product owner is identifying valuable things to do and the team is doing them and producing a good return on that investment, does it matter how efficient they are? To me, yes. Why? So let's let's and this this is actually why I was bringing this up, Fred. Mm-hmm. Let's take that Roman Pitchler story that you were you were telling earlier, right? right? We've got this big two-year project, but let's let's pretend they nailed it. That was exactly what the market wanted, and it solved the need, and they were able to 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 recoup their costs, whatever that dollar amount is, right? So they they did their waterfall thing, they went for two years and delivered it, right? Okay. But but let's just say hypothetically somebody said, hey, you know what? After one year, let's release it. And then we'll spend the, the next year working on the next piece of it, okay. right? That is an additional year of value, literal dollars and cents, right? Like revenue that is coming into the organization that we would have originally missed out on by having to wait an additional year. Okay. So okay. there is value in time to market, right? There is value in minimizing your cost of delay. And so that's why on the product side of the house is even if I do everything perfectly, right, I make all the right bets, um, I still want to minimize my feedback loop. I still want to get things out to market as quickly and as frequently as possible. Like, hey, we're releasing every other week. Fantastic. Can we get that down to one week? Mm -hmm. Because, again, I'm just shortening that that, uh, time to market. Right. I'm yeah. optimizing how much revenue that I'm or value that I'm going to be potentially delivering. And so that's yeah. that's why I, I do feel like the operational side of the house is something that I should be concerned about. OK, well, you know, I don't disagree with anything you said. Uh, you need to have short feedback loops. And, you know, in the Scrum framework, that whole idea is captured in the idea of having a sprint, which is a fixed period of time during which work is done and value is produced. And there's usually a a big debate between the product side and the developer side because the product owner wants fast turnaround. They want short sprints so they can see value get created quickly and can get it into the marketplace and get feedback. Developers usually want long sprints. They want to have a nice, comfortable period of time where they can get everything done, dot the I's, cross the T's, and not feel rushed or pressured. So uh, they would prefer very long sprints. So there's a debate between the product side and the development side about how long a sprint should be. And in the end, they have to come to some kind of agreement. Now, most of the world these days seems to just fix, settle on two weeks uh, mm-hmm. And that's fine. Uh, the Scrum Guide says you really shouldn't have a sprint longer than one month because that's too long. You, 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 lose, you lose track of what the customer wants. But, but anyway, the idea is, you know, if you're talking about efficiency in terms of getting deliverable stuff into the hands of customers, you're right. Short is better. By the way, I have personal experience a long time ago working – in a situation where I was doing one day sprints, uh, which worked out great. It worked out wonderfully because I delivered, I was the developer that time a long time ago, but I delivered something valuable every day. And my product owner who was the controller of the company uh, could see the progress, uh, always knew what he wanted. It was a wonderful situation uh, and we did great things. So, but again, my question is if, if a comp if a, if developers are delivering good value, uh, well in excess of what it's costing for them to be there, you know, why do you care about how efficiently they're doing it? Yeah, so I, I guess I would say I don't care about how many hours they work or mm-hmm. how they work. Mm-hmm. What I care about is, to Jeff's point, I care about time to delivery. Time is okay. the thing I want to optimize for. I, I am impatient with delay inside of a system. And so that's the efficiency that I'm trying to get is like any delay we have, 
okay. to getting something out into a marketplace to test it. I want to try to optimize that so I can figure out what to do best next, right? Like these things are mm-hmm. all connected. Okay. Well, in the Scrum framework, you can deliver something to market as soon as it's done. You know, if you have a mod to something and it takes three days to do it, well, at the end of the three days, if it meets the definition of done, you can get it in the marketplace because it's ready to be given to a customer. And I agree with you. I mean, it's it's deadly to say, okay, we're going to work on this and the customer is going to see it six months from now. That's that's a recipe for disaster because so much can change between now and six months from now. So, you know, the product and the product owner's job is to keep an eye on what's happening in the marketplace and to adjust. The product owner can change that to do list, the product backlog at any time. And doesn't have to justify that to anybody. So, you know, the, when, when you when you have a sprint, pretty much the developers and the product owner have agreed on what they're going to do. If the product owner wants to stop in the middle and say, hey, let's not do that anymore. Things have changed. Well, the developers have to agree to that or else they, they won't change now. But the, the next time uh, a sprint starts, they'll have a new uh, agreement, a new negotiation where they're negotiating based on what the product owner now thinks are the most valuable, important things to do. So, so um, I want to jump in real quick. Okay. What one of the things to kind of to go along with what you're saying here, Fred? Um, I just googled over here the word continuous because that's not a word that I'm going to memorize. But if, if we look at the, the the definition of the word continuous right. is uninterrupted in time, sequence, substance, or extent. So let's just take that first one. Okay. Uninterrupted in time, right? Okay. We have this thing called continuous integration and continuous deployment. Right. So if I'm thinking of deployment as uninterrupted in time, like we're doing that shit all the time. We're yeah. deploying constantly. Yeah. And so every one of those, every one of those little deployments is an increment. It's something that is done and being given to a customer. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want greedily as that product person, I want as many of those as I can get within a sprint, Right. Right. The sprint is just saying, minimally, you got to give me one. You got to give me one increment. But if you can give me two, three, four, five a day, like, hey, that's fantastic. Give them to me. I want it. I want continuous value delivery going out to a customer. And every one of those, to, to what Jeff was talking about earlier, like, that's an opportunity to learn, right? Are we yeah. building the right thing? How quickly can we determine that we're building the wrong thing? How much value are we getting out there, minimizing that time to market? Like, I'm repeating myself here. But that's also an opportunity for me to potentially change direction as the product person, right? right? Those are just more opportunities to learn and switch around. And so, I guess, I'm not trying to be a stick in the mud, but that's why I care about those delivery metrics. That's why I care about the, the quote unquote operational metrics. I want okay. more flexibility. The more flexibility you can give me as a as a developer, okay. awesome. I love it. Give me that flexibility. Okay. Well, perhaps there's a misunderstanding here because I agree with you completely. But you know, there's a misunderstanding about the nature of a sprint that is very common and very frustrating to me because people assume that you can only deliver something at the end of a sprint. Mm -hmm. So you work on a whole bunch of stuff, you create an increment, and then the sprint review, there's a final check to make sure it does what you expected it to, and then you deliver. That's the common misunderstanding. It's not like that at all. You see, in a sprint, you can, as you say, do continuous and in, you know, deployment, continuous integration, continuous deployment, you can put something into production at any time. The only requirement is that it meets the definition of done. In other words, that it's really done and ready to give to a client. You can do that five times a day, you know, and, and there are, are companies where they deliver to production, you know, very, 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 I'm trying to find the right word there. They, they do it all the time. Uh, you can do it 30, 40, 50 times a day. You know, there, there are some situations, some, some companies that basically deliver to production 50, 60, 70 times a day because the stuff that they're delivering is finished. It's done. It's ready to go to a customer. 
you don't have to wait to the end of the sprint. Mm -hmm. A sprint is just a measuring tool. It's just a period of time within which you do work. So it's possible to measure the work that gets done in that period of time. That's how you can do get that predictability you're talking about. If you can do so many different uh, features in one sprint, then you have an idea of what the pace of the team is. How many features can it do? Uh, and now hopefully each feature has a dollar value on it put there by the product owner. If you do this feature, it's going to be worth this much to us. And therefore, you can calculate the value that a team produces per sprint. Uh, at least so according I'll push to back on you. I'll push okay. I'll push back on that though cuz that's assumed value. You think that's what it's going to give you. We'll see when you get into production. That's exactly right. Now who assume who makes who puts that value on there? That's the product owner. The product owner is making a bet. Mm -hmm. And the bet has to be quantized. In other words, you can't just say, well, I think this is going to be valuable. You have to say, well, I think this will be valuable enough to justify the expense of doing it. So the product owner is the one who makes those decisions and has to bear accountability. When you actually can sell something or realize the cost reduction, then you know what the value is and you can judge whether the product owner used good judgment or not. Did they make good investment decisions? But the, the, the point is that at the end of every sprint, you, you have a way to measure what happened so that you can, in effect, do some prediction stuff. Now, people think that the sprint review is some kind of quality control check. It's, you know, you develop, you demonstrate to the product owner that you actually did what they wanted. That's not the purpose of the sprint review. You're reviewing stuff that probably is already in production because it met the definition of done and got moved in there. What you're doing is you're looking at what the product now does after the work that you did with the idea of saying, well, wow, you know, that's what it does now. We, now that we see it with our own eyes, we have more ideas about what it could do next. You know, I, I, I talk a lot, but there's a good story that I have about how the sprint review actually works. And I'd be happy to, to tell it if, if uh, we have time. Would that sure. be okay? Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, some time ago, I was teaching people how to be scrum masters and product owners by organizing development teams and then having them do uh, a free software for not-for-profit organizations. And there was one, uh, it was a, basically a family foundation that was from a, a wine producing family. You know, in California, there are plenty of vineyards and plenty of families that have produced wine. And one of these had a great big estate near San Francisco. And of course, it was a winery, so there are lots of fields everywhere. But, you know, these people loved plants. So they had a very, very intricate, varied garden full of all kinds of interesting stuff. Uh, and what they did with their estate, you know, the, the foundation decided to provide camps, summer camps, if you will, for kids with cancer. So, you know, these kids, they, they live their lives in hospitals, poke full, full of needles and stuff. And anyway, they got a chance for, you know, a camp period, a couple of weeks to be kids. And they loved the garden. They ran around and there were all kinds of interesting things. There's even a plant called a sticky monkey, which I, I never saw. But anyway, they, they just loved running around and looking at all this stuff. And uh, But the, the problem was they would look at something and then they, hey, counselor, come here, counselor. Hey, what's that? What's that? And, of course, the camp counselors were just college kids and they weren't botanists. And so they kind of said, well, darn, I don't know. So anyway, we, we contacted these people and they said, oh, well, you know what? We got a bunch of iPads donated to us, which we haven't had anything to do with it. Would it be possible to put some kind of a garden guide on the iPad so that the camp counselors wouldn't have to know about all these plants? It could just all be in the iPad. And so uh, the, I, the, ended up the, the strategy was that we we're going to create a bunch of barcodes for all the different plants. 
And then, you know, an iPad had a camera. You can hit the barcode with a camera. And then the idea would be that information about the plant would, would come up and be displayed. So uh, after the first sprint, after two weeks, uh, we had the foundation people come down uh, to see what had happened. And uh, the team hadn't been able to create the barcodes yet but they were able to project one on a wall and then they were able to hit that barcode with an iPad camera and up popped information about the plant. And the uh, foundation people were saying, wow, that's amazing. After just two weeks, there's the plant and there's blurb about it. There's, there's information about it. Wow, that's great. Wow. wow. Um, oh, um, uh, could, could we have more than one picture? Huh? Well, you see, a plant doesn't look the same in the springtime or the summer or the fall or the winter, and we want the kid to be able to look at the plant and recognize it. And so we have more than And then the developer said, oh, 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 you want a carousel. You want to be able to display the picture of the plant based on what the season is. Oh, and the iPad has a calendar. We can figure out what season it is. Would you? Would, is that what you'd like? You'd like to have, you know, you know four pictures rotating season. By, and the develop and the foundation people says, "Wow, you can do that." And the builder says, "Yes, yes, you have. It's, it's a piece of cake. We can do that." And so the product owner then wrote down carousel of pictures, season sensitive, which got onto the to do list. And then one of the developers said, "Hey, you know what? Uh, would you like this thing to talk?" And the foundation people says, what? And the boss says, well, this is, this is Apple iOS, and it's got great text-to-speech features. We can put a button on here that says talk, and it can read the picture out loud. Would that be good? And the foundation people said, wow, it can do that? You mean we can give this to kids who can't see? And the boss says, sure, sure, no. Wow. And the product owner then wrote down text-to-speech button. So, so that's the purpose of the sprint review. It's not to do a quality check. It's to stimulate ideas about what could be done next. And it's, based, it's best done with the, the, the customer there so that they can come up with ideas about what would be valuable to them. Mm-hmm. So, so anyway. That, that, yeah, a lot of people call it. Yeah, a lot of people call it the demo, right? But it's so much more than that. So that's yeah. you know, if you're if you're just doing a demo, you're missing out. You're only getting partial value of what you could be getting in that event. That's right. So, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, the purpose of the sprint review is to let the customer react to what you've done and come up with more new ideas. And I wish people understood that. Say love me. <laughs> so. Well, I've been Martin, kind of up on my um, Fred, this has been a. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, that's all right. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, we've been recording for a while. Um, as we kind of wrap this up, is there anything you want to uh, plug to our listeners? Plug to your listeners. Yeah. Well, uh, learn the Scrum framework, learn it correctly. There's a whole lot of misinformation on the web about it. Uh, and, and I can go on and on about that. Of course, I writ- wrote a couple of books about it. Uh, they're on Amazon. If you want to search for, for Fred Fowler, you'll probably find the books. Um, what else? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. If people have questions, they can uh, contact me via LinkedIn. Just make sure that you indicate that uh, you, you, you heard me on the Agile Wire. So I'll know it's not some blast of uh, spam stuff on LinkedIn. And uh, that's all I can think of. Um, it's just, but uh, you know, oh, here's one more thing. People focus on the Scrum framework based on what's in the Scrum guide, and the Scrum guide says it all, except it says it in a way that people misunderstand. Scrum, the Scrum guide presents Scrum as a recipe. In other words, do it this way, and it'll work. And the implication is, well, if it doesn't work, you must not be doing it right. And that's not what makes Scrum work. It's not the form of what makes Scrum work. What makes Scrum work is the division of responsibility. Have a business person make the business decisions. 
have technical people make the technical decisions, iterate so that you have measurable progress, and hold everybody accountable for the decisions that they can make. If you do that, I don't care if you use the Scrum framework or anything else. It's just make sure that the business people aren't making the technical decisions. Make sure the technical people are not making the business decisions and keep everybody honest by measuring what's going on. And that's the recipe for success. Thank you for listening to The Agile Wire. We are consistently inspecting and adapting ourselves. We would appreciate feedback at feedback at theagilewire.com or on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play Store. See you next time.